any party, doesn't matter which one, cannot afford a just massive reset. I mean, it, it, you wouldn't have a recession, you would have an outright catastrophe and depression, which would be prohibitive to being able to even finance what you have to finance. The whole system wouldn't work. So I, I'm almost I'm almost afraid we've gotten to the point now where financial markets have to be managed to prevent the unthinkable. Now you you would probably ask me, well, how is this all sustainable? Beats the hell out of me. <laughs> but if if you're trapped in that way, you have no choice but to continue. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. The bears had every opportunity to break the markets over the past few years. From a global pandemic with a broad economic shutdown to a resulting 40-year high in inflation, followed by the most aggressive rate hike cycle in history. But the bears failed. The markets are back at all-time highs and likely to power a lot higher from here if the Archie expects plays out predicts technical analyst Sven Henrik of NorthmanTrader.com. He knows this isn't a popular prediction amongst those skeptical of today's lofty market valuations, and Sven himself doesn't like this prediction. He recently released a report titled The Cynic's Guide to Markets, laying out the rationale for the sanguine market outlook, which I'll ask him to summarize for us in today's conversation. Sven, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Adam. Great to be back with you, and congrats on the new channel. It's doing great. Thank you, brother. And the fact that we landed Sven Henrik is going to bring it to new highs, I'm absolutely sure. Um, but no, buddy, it's always great to see you. Thank you. We always have great discussions. The challenge is hacking him into a single conversation. We're going to do our best here. Um, I really want to dig into your, your cynics guide to, to markets because uh, I know it's a message a lot of people, myself included, kind of don't really want to hear but it may just be reality. So it's an important conversation to have. Real quick before we get to that, though, just to set the stage, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, maybe I'll start with uh, financial markets. Uh, well, I guess the quote of the week is, the future is so bright, we just got to upgrade. Right? That was <laughs> Morgan Stanley on January 30th for the banks and of course the financial index dropped six percent in two days right after uh look we've come out of a very powerful rally s p up 20 percent since the october lows this followed up on actually the discussion we had a couple of discussions we, you and i had last year one was the main message was liquidity and uh, the other one was technicals and then of course the powers that be uh in the background and it has culminated basically as a result of just the most dramatic easing in financial conditions we've ever seen and that's, that's by the way one of those things in, in markets that we all had to contend with in the last four years basically every year we see something we've never seen before uh, remember jay powell in september talked about how higher yields were helping the fed in bringing inflation down you know, and then right after that, it all fell apart. And now we have basically a bonanza for uh, markets. And so in principle, and this is maybe where we can pull up one chart that you and I discussed last time, that was the one year yield. Uh, my position back then was to say, look, if we get through a evident peak in a cycle in yields, that is going to be opening the door to a market runway to new highs. Uh, the one-year yield peaked in, in the fall. And by the way, I should just add, this is very important to understand as well, this was right around the time, as you guys all recall, every Fed speaker was talking higher for longer, higher for longer, higher for longer. And right at the beginning of October, Janet Yellen suddenly came out and she said, higher for longer may not necessarily be a given. And you and I talked about last year how you know, the Yellen factor, better pay attention to what Yellen says. So she went completely against the grain. 
in terms of what the Fed was positioning. And lo and behold, we got a massive reversal in yields just a couple of weeks later. And what this chart, the, the same chart I showed last year was basically saying, you know, as soon as you have that turn in the yields, you get a major relief rally. It's, it's the relief from the peak tightening. And we've seen this in cycle after cycle after cycle. The question always was, and is here too, you know, if there is to be a recession, how long is the runway? In some cases, months, in some cases, years. We don't know the answer to that. But what I would submit to you that in context of this historic chart, everything we've seen in markets so far is completely consistent with history. So on, on that basis, there's been no surprise just on that level. And we'll go more into technicals later because there's other things that are developing that are far from usual, in fact, outright bizarre. And, and so in context, you know, you, you get, and we got this in 2006 as well, you know, you get all this um, soft landing optimism and so forth. And you, you're you looking basically at Goldilocks data right now in terms of the economy, right? Because you, you see solid GDP growth on paper. You see falling inflation. You see a reduction in yields. You see a massive easing of financial conditions. And so, you know, price drives sentiment and therefore everybody's optimistic again. Um, is the economy as strong as it appears? This is, the, you know, as bullish as we've been, you know, I, I am a bit concerned that we're all looking at a rigged deck to a certain degree, because the reality is last year, we've seen the largest non-US recessionary deficit in history turn out to be $2 trillion. You know, the, the, the dream team that put out the forecast last year, at the beginning of last year, pointed out to a one and a half trillion dollar deficit. Well, we got a $2 trillion deficit and debt increased by $2.7 trillion. You know, this is a, a level of fiscal impulse you usually only see uh, during an actual recession when they have to come in and rescue everything and stimulate. Right. To or see war. This in, yeah. It, to, to see this in this context you, you just got to recognize that this is overstating everything. I mean, not like we're ever going to have a balanced budget, but presume for a moment we had a balanced budget, GDP growth wouldn't be anywhere where near it is. You know, you talked about the labor market. You can say, well, the labor market's held, holding in. Yeah, fair enough. You can say that's basically on the surface true. And it's not in past cycles it's not until the labor market properly cracks that something bad happens but you know who's doing the hiring here and in fact i had pulled up a chart um a while this last week i think i was looking at the labor force in general and it's the civilian labor force is the government labor force right the the government hiring i mean half the jobs for the last couple of years have come from government hiring and we just saw a seven hundred thousand people drop in the civilian labor force in December, which I found interesting. Well, government hiring continues to roll up, right? Mm -hmm. And and so the, in, in fact, the civilian labor force is now below where it was last August, which I, I kind of found surprising. So there's there's these counter forces where I say, okay, what's, what's the real story here, you know? Um, but then I ask these questions, and I also have to ask the next question, which is, does it matter? You know, if if you have, and this is the experiment, and this is maybe where now we go and veer off into the bit unusual here, because we've never seen this before, this type of fiscal impulse in a non-recessionary environment, is that so dominating that it will actually mask over any potential lag effect issues you may still have? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. And, and be clear, they're not stopping this year. You know, they, they may talk about maybe having lower funding requirements this year, but the CBO just came out this week and their forecast is for $1.6 trillion deficit again this year. And of course, if you get any surprises, that's going right back up to $2 trillion. So this, this fiscal impulse part 
is still with us. And, and so from that perspective, you can argue maybe, all right, maybe I'll just keep this going and whatever negatives there may be will be overshadowed by this behemoth of spending that continues to roll throughout the, the economy. Having said all of that, I think you guys all just noticed that in recent days, the layoff announcements come rolling in by the tens of thousands. In, in fact, uh, on some levels, what between 80, 90,000 depends on how you count that for the month of January. It's quite an uptick from what we've seen in the latter part of 2023. And the reason for that, I think that's very important to note as well, is companies had greatly benefited from all the inflation, right? Because inflation was a great way for companies to pass on higher prices to consumer consumers and that cranked up the profit margins well guess what inflation has been coming down and now you have the counter effect and you got pressure on profit margins and what you're going to do is you're going to cut fat which means you're going to lay off employees right sizing they called it back in the day mm -hmm. right and so okay so now you're going to have more and more people become unemployed is it systemic at this point where you have to be concerned that all of a sudden the entire economy cracks no not yet this, this can go on for months and it's only at the point when this becomes more systemic and you see companies across the board lay off in major amounts that all of a sudden this will then impact, you know, classic retail spending because people have to tighten their belts. So from that perspective, we're looking at officially fantastic data. The party can keep rolling. The deficit keeps on rolling. There's some warning signs and in terms of slowing. Uh, but hey, even even just now, before we started recording, I saw the Atlanta Fed coming out and they're coming out. They just cranked up their Q1 GDP forecast from what, 3.5% or 3% to over 4.2%. Mm. Just like that. Great job slowing things down. Looks like we, we keep accelerating on the growth front, which is kind of what you would expect from record loosening of financial conditions. You know, so I kind of mixed up the, the market and the economy a little bit, but there is a larger market message. This, this rally here has, um, on one hand, not surprised from the technical perspective, but its makeup is very unusual. And we can discuss that in a, in a bit as well. And I had this week in a new video flagged out a, a few warning signs that have me a bit cautionary here. Okay, uh, great intro. So many things I want to dig into. Uh, again, the long arc here of the discussion is we want to get to your cynics guide. So I, I, even though we're going to take a little bit of an indirect route there, we are going to get there, folks. Um, okay, I got a number of things here. Um, I guess the first one, um, you talked about things playing out like they they have in history so far. Um, when yields peak, um, and I'll see if I can bring up that chart again in just a second. Um, you know, when, 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 um, the, the fed hikes the discount rate, uh, and then stops and then, you know, begins to cut, uh, that's typically when we enter a recession, um, or at least when we, when we've entered recessions recently, that has been the precedent pattern, right? Um, got to differentiate here because there's. There's the, I call it two phases. The first phase is yield relief. That gives you the market runway, right? right. Yields, okay? And right, so the market party is right. It hears, oh, they're done. Market they're done parties. Picking. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Everything is cool. The worst is over, blah, blah, blah. It is then at the point where dropping, there is a point where dropping yields are no longer reflecting, you know, the, the relief part but they're actually reflecting an economy that is slowing down dramatically. Right. And it's usually the Fed is behind the curve and they're like, oh my gosh, we tightened too, too much or for too long and now we get to cut like that's crazy. Right. That, that's, yeah. the, that's the typical lag effect part of it. And then yield relief turns into yield terror. And typically that's what happens when the yield curves uninvert back to positive. Right. Which they've because been creeping in that direction, right? I think creeping in that direction, but they, they haven't in the big ones haven't crossed yet. Yep. And need to basically across the spectrum. So from that perspective, the runway still exists and markets can still move higher. It's it's when 
you see, and by the way, this is why it's kind of interesting yesterday because we saw yields drop and markets drop with it. But today yields drop lower and markets bounce back up, right? So this tit for tat game still continues. Uh, you, you need to see evidence of an actual shift in in the dynamics. I don't think we've got anything confirmed on that front yet. Okay. So um, I'm just pulling the chart up here just so folks can see. We don't have recessions shaded um, on this chart, but you'll see this pattern of of rise in uh, interest rates, then a peak and a plateau, and then they they plummet. And you see that before you know the dot com bust. You see that before the great financial crisis. Um, you see it in 2019, and we ended up having a recession triggered by the pandemic. But a lot of people, I think even yourself included. Uh, Sven, I think we probably would have had a recession even without the pandemic. It would have been some other trigger. Um, and then now, you know, we, we we're up at the apex here. What's kind of interesting is these these previous ones generally had sort of a bit of a plateau, where rates kind of hung out for a quarter or two. Um, here, not, not in '95, not in '95, right? Or in in um, was it '89? You're, you're right. Early, earlier, they're more peaky. And it looks like we're, yeah. we're back to a peak here. So, so all I want to say here is I'm just going to connect a couple dots. So we've had people on the program before, uh, like uh, Darius Dale, who has looked at similar charts and said, hey, you know, the, the, the markets tend to party their hardest right up until the wheels come off there. We talk about it, how the party gets it, it's, its most raging right before the cops show up, right? So that that party into the recession is sort of like what you're talking about here, Sven, where, oh, okay, uh, the Fed announced that it's it's done hiking and they're now talking about cutting. You get this sort of relief rally going on. Seems to be what's happening now. Now, TBD, if this is going to follow the script that the previous cycles have, because you're raising a really important question here, which is, hey, yeah, normally we would expect the lag effects from all of that hiking and the quantitative tightening and everything to catch up with us. But we've had this massive wave of liquidity, including all this tremendous fiscal spending. And I'm I, so your question, which I think is a very valid one, is will that overwhelm the lag effect this time? And and maybe that'll just give a nice kind of permanent it's runway to this party to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so I, I'm I'm reminded of the the Titler quote that said that um democracies can exist. Uh up until the point where the public realizes it can vote itself largesse from the treasury. To me, it almost feels like the government has realized that it can vote itself largesse from the treasury, where the government is now just spending like a drunken sailor to keep the party going. And, you know, my question is, is like, can they stop it, right? Like politically, like ever, right? In other words, like th think of a program like Obamacare, and I, I don't wanna say, or the affordable health care. I, I don't wanna say it's good or it's bad, but, but I remember hearing at the time that the strategy was, let's expand healthcare coverage for all these people that weren't covered. And then it's gonna be just so politically unpopular to ever take that away, right? So now that the government is out there basically spending as extremely as it is, is there anybody, new president, whoever, you know, new Fed chair, whatever, who, who can step in and say, ah, you know what, we're going to we're going to start switching to austerity and we're going to have to start tightening our belts here. Like, I wonder if the if the horse is out of the barn on this one and they politically really can't stop it. Well, I have a, I have a few comments on that. Yeah, um, I've never known you not to have all, a strong views. Just so everybody's clear, we live in, in a in an age where last year with a straight face, the Treasury secretary went in front of Congress and pre presented a fiscal responsibility act that called for $2 trillion deficits as far as the eye can see. Okay. And it was passed. And ever since any, you know, ooh, government shutdown, whatever, every time the can gets kicked. In and, fact, and sorry to, to, just to interject, like, to be clear, like, we don't have a debt ceiling limit at this point in time. <laughs> no, we don't. It's kicked into 2025. I have a question for you, Adam. How many light, nights of sleep have you lost since the U.S. debt has hit $20 trillion? I mean, I worry about it a lot. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but like, I do worry about it a lot. I, I'm just asking because Janet Yellen in 2017, December 2017, it says, you know, 
20 trillion dollar debt should keep everyone awake at night in 2018 in january she said you know the deficits are not sustainable this was at a time debt 20 trillion dollars interest payments on debt were 500 billion dollars not even quite but like 450 and now just a few years later we're sitting at 34 trillion dollars going on 35 trillion pretty much in the next quarter who knows and interest and in debt has more than doubled now over one trillion dollars and there's no end in sight um has what has changed is it is it just political posturing because now janet yellen is in is overseeing all this but it, it's power the same thing you know they've all been saying these things for years this, this these are not you know internet bears that are complaining about the debt that was the head of the federal reserve janet yellen and now jay powell saying these things and all of a sudden now we're in this phase where okay you know what and fair enough i mean i, I when i first saw them going into rate hikes into the highest debt construct ever my view was something's gonna break mm -hmm. guess what nothing's broken and the fact that nothing is broken and they're going to continue on this path because there's no way out to your point there actually is no way out you, you they're completely trapped by this construct now in you know you, you maybe 10 15 years ago you could have said okay let's do some austerity let's try to be disciplined and we'll just take the pain maybe you could have done that back then but i think it's gotten so large so big as part of the economy i mean interest payments alone are bigger than now the entire u.s military budget and guess what one trillion dollars is, is just going to be the beginning part of this this is going to go to two to three trillion dollars it's going to blow out the entire discretionary u.s budget of the u.s it's insane and and so you you got to keep wondering how is this is all going to get funded ultimately and it's it's not not just the numbers that have been taken on it's the maturities of the previous debt that had been financed during the low interest rate area because we're going to see trillions of dollars in maturities coming due this year and next year mm -hmm. and they're going to have to be refinanced at much higher rates so yes myself and a lot of people have been wondering for a long time how is this how is this math going to actually work and well, Janet Yellen has an answer. She said, don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> the same person that said to lose sleep at night over $20 trillion. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to be sensational about this, but is this like the captain kind of ordering the wait staff to bring out the good champagne and caviar on the Titanic just, just, just to keep people calm and distracted while he's trying to figure out how the heck do we deal with this water that's rushing in? I would love to see a podcast of Janet Yellen in 2017 talking to the Janet Yellen in 2024. I'd, I'd be really curious to see how that conversation uh, would would go. No, I mean, it, it is a real reality. And by the way, this reality has mattered to market participants in the last few months. I go back to when I said, you know, the Fed saying higher for longer, higher for longer, out comes Janet Yellen saying it's not necessarily a given. But it, there's, it's not an accident that she is saying that because of the mathematics of it all. She, has a, as, a, as a Treasury Secretary, has a real need to see lower interest coming and lower interest rates coming and coming fast because they're going to run into to a wall where, right. the, where the, the size of the interest payments alone will just choke out all growth because they're, they're going to be so constrained by that so she really needs lower rates and th and that's why when i was watching this this show between higher for longer and not higher for longer you, you gotta wonder who's really in charge of everything and then fast forward from october to december jay powell coming out and saying it's way too soon to talk about rate cuts and 12 days later he goes we talked about the rate cuts right <laughs> okay so what happened in those 12 Wait, yeah, does that maybe reveal who's stronger in this battle? Yeah, I think absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, look, the reality is the way that this was managed with reverse repo and, and the funding requirements was pretty clear that 
Janet Yellen was willing to take on higher interest payments in order to avoid going through reverse repo. So basically, she helped fuel a bunch of liquidity into the market, which helped the easing financial conditions. And and when you saw that massive drop in financial in, in loosening of financial conditions in in the lead up to the December Fed meeting, you would have thought Powell would stand up and say, "Hey, this is." In terms of our inflation mission, this is not what we want to see. Instead, he he doubled on down, causing even further easing in financial conditions and lighting the rally even further on fire. And that that made very little sense on 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 paper. So I'm look, you know, I didn't bring my tin foil hat here, but <laughs> you you got to look for the messaging and what happens after the messaging. And especially who is messaging and what uh, and when. And it's pretty clear to me that given the math realities that there's big, big powers at play that need to manage this without blowing things up. And that's and that's why I think, you know, if you look at the yearly chart, for example, that I that I brought along, um this you know, on the S P, this is this is a chart you and I discussed last year. You know, and as you said in the outset, look, we had a global pandemic. We had the highest inflation in 40 years and we had the most aggressive rate hike cycle and what broke nothing. I mean, that, that little, that COVID crash looks like a little dip. This is, by the way, if you look at the EMA, that a five EMA, it's the exponential moving average. And it's one of those super long-term charts that basically tells you, okay, when are you know, actually structural bear market and when you're just having a little corrective move. And COVID crash, global pandemic, it totally fell below. And we all know what happened. And it just got printed away by the end of the year, closed far above it. So it never happened. And then, of course, we had continued printing into the top of the you know long-term trend line from the 1920s. Imagine that. And then 22, all 22 was, was a, a dip back at the yearly five EMA. And by the way, that dip to the yearly five EMA, you know, it's moved up since, but that was precisely the moment Janet Yellen came out and said she was concerned about liquidity in the treasury market. And that was it. And last year we had at the beginning of the year, you know, March banking crisis, little selling at the beginning of the year, that was the tag then. And of course, Yellen was concerned and that was it. So I'm, I'm just looking at control and I'm I'm looking at this at this in terms of, you know, who's in charge here, and you just got to objectively look at this and say, what? Nothing has happened. It was basically an ongoing bull market fueled by money. When they didn't have to remove the money spigot a little bit, they let it happen to a certain degree, and then every time the market was this close to breaking, they flipped the switch, and and last year basically. When you, if you want to view it through the lens of the official monetary tightening process, there was no monetary tightening last year on a net basis. Yeah, the balance sheet rolled off. But by the way, this is very different to QE. When during QT, you have a passive rollover. It's not like that they're actively dumping assets. It's passive. They let just them roll off the balance sheet. What, what happened was with the BTFP bank rescue program with bank reserves and by the way during that initial rescue they obviously expanded the balance sheet again before starting the passive rollover again the, the, those those were maybe the lessons from 2008 that they applied which is you don't wait until things break you start intervening right at the moment when they look like they're breaking uh, or could be breaking and and so on that basis, you just got to look at this objectively and say, okay, who's in control? Well, bulls are in control. That's reality. And bears, with every excuse in the book, couldn't break anything. Sorry to say. And now, you know, we're way above the yearly five EMA again. And maybe, maybe you get lucky and you, you got another attack this year. But it's not until you break that thing and stay below it for for at least a second year. And it just hasn't happened since, guess what, early 2000. I mean, well, I should say the financial crisis, guys. We had one big red candle in 2008. And we all know what happened in March of 2009. Big old intervention again. And that was yeah. the end of it.
Yeah. So, you know, we all look at things in, you know, daily, weekly time frames, but if you look at the big picture, it's pretty clear who's in control at this point, for sure. You know? So then the question I have, maybe philosophically, is to say, if, if you can't break the market with a global pandemic, record inflation, and a record tightening cycle, what's it going to take? I think that's a great question. And and undeniably looking at this chart here, yeah, the, the bulls have had the preponderance of the winds here. Um, I'm curious, we're, we see the EMA line, um, it's getting up near the high end of this range. And when we've seen that happen in the past, uh, it has come off a bit or, or gone sideways for some prolonged period of time. Um, do you expect that to happen here again? Or could we potentially punch above <laughs> this long-term channel uh, upward limit here into kind of unknown territory? Well, in terms of the pink line on top, you know, the, the, this is actually farther than it seems. But, you know, you can make the case around 5,400, 5,500 for, for this year. And obviously it's it's rising in terms of the yearly five EMA. I would simply say you get a reconnect in most years and then it's either support or it falls through. But in most cases, it's support, as we just seen in the last three years again. Uh, you can even make the case it held obviously during COVID, even though it temporarily pierced it. Um, but you know, it, a tag is not a requirement either. You, know, you you may say see some years where it doesn't tag it, right? In in the early '90s, for example, right? Or even a couple of times, you know, in in other decades. In in most cases, you see a reconnect, and and so maybe that's. A potential event happening, and we we can talk about twenty twenty four and from a strategic perspective, in into twenty twenty five, uh, what maybe to expect there. But at the moment, we're we're pretty sizably disconnected from it, and at some point we may approach it uh, because I don't expect twenty four to be all smooth sailing either. Okay, um, and that's perhaps a good entree into your. Cynics Guide to Markets. Um, so I want to let you talk about it in any way you want to. The kind of key too long didn't read somewhere I took away from it was uh, you, you think that 2024 could, could be a bumpy ride. Um, but what you're more confident about is that if we do have any um, real weakness, particularly in the economy, um, that the response to that is going to be overwhelming and that that would then likely ignite a very strong market rally say perhaps in the 2025 or whatnot depending upon obviously when that breakage might happen um did i get the crib notes right yeah i mean look i given what i just outlined you know i i i actually hate it i'm, I'm, I'm talking a position that i actually hate to be supportive of in a way and because i'm not supportive of it but basically this is where the cynic comes in and by the way if you remember good old george carlin if you scratch a cynic cynic you'll find a disappointed idealist and and, and maybe that's part of what's going on here because you know i would i would love free markets and and i would love you know proper price discovery blah 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 but as we've seen again everything got crushed and saved you know you just have to be extremely practical about the control pivots uh, and and where they are and what's happening behind the, the scenes unfortunately now the the cynics guy basically first acknowledged that you know all the bullish structures from liquidity to historic yield turns to um you know the, the relief runway have led to the rally that we talked about last year into this year um, but now the setup technically, and that's based on a number of factors. One is technically, the other one is historical, and the third one is actually seasonal. We aren't in a presidential election year. They have their own seasonal quirks, if you will, which calls for initial chop in kind of the first quarter, if you will, with intermittent new highs on the year. 
I would argue that so far, that's exactly what we've seen. We saw intermittent new highs. We saw chop, and we'll talk about what's happening underneath the indis, main indices in a bit as well, because uh, that's really critical as well. But it says, you know, it's kind of going to linger along uh, for the rest of the year. There's going to be some more corrective activity. And then guess what? Yet another rally into the end of the year, because that seems to be the standard script, right? Uh, I could argue that maybe this year, has potential for more political volatility because here too, we're facing a very unprecedented type of presidential election. Uh, and, and none of us have a clue, you know, how that's going to turn out, um, no no doubt. But that there's always flip side, right? There's flip side for risk or big relief rally or if it's a big nothing burger, right? So that's all to be determined. But what's interesting to me, and I... I just realized that late last year, and then I put in some more thoughts into that during the cynics guide of markets. And there's actually a, I saw a 10 year cycle chart on the S&P. And it, it was kind of fascinating to me because I never looked at markets in, in this context. Again, you know, much, much bigger time frame, And it had a certain flow to it with basically a, just a glaring big rip into year five and i said to myself well that you know maybe that's driven by a couple of years or what have you but no i went back and i looked at every single decade since 1900 every single one of them and i have the article on on my website you can you can see it there i actually think it's still my pinned tweet um you know things can always change things can always be varied and what have you in all these decades Obviously, tremendous events happen, or recessions happen, and crises happen, and wars happen, you, you name it. And what all of these things say, every single one of them, is no matter what happens in year four, whether it's a stable, bullish year, or whether it's a really choppy year, or if it's even a bearish year, which has happened a couple of times in these fourth years. But no matter what happens, the fifth year is up. Mm. Show me one fifth year in a decade that's not been up. You can't because they all have been up. I mean, not even an exception. I was like, really? <laughs> that, that, that's incredible. And, and what it also says is that then trouble starts brewing in the latter part of the decade. And, and you, you may still have to, you know, like in year seven and year eight, and then you may have a big rally in year nine. And then you have trouble in the beginning part of the decade. But you don't need to go back to 1900 to get a sense that actually we've just all experienced that. I mean, after all, what was 1999? It was a big up year. Mm -hmm. What was the first couple of years in, in 2000? It was a recession. It was trouble, right? Guess what, what 2015 was? It was an up year. I mean, 2005, right? That was, a, that was an up year. When did the trouble happen? Seventh and eighth year. Right, we peaked in two thousand seven. We had the crisis in eight, and guess what? Even though year nine, two thousand nine, started down, it ripped up. Right, we did have some corrective activity in two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve, two thousand fifteen was up. Guess what? Two thousand eighteen, down year. Right, what was two thousand nineteen, the ninth year, back up? And then what happened at the beginning of the ca uh, decade? COVID crash, and two thousand twenty two was a down year. Right. And what did the cycle chart say? 2003, it starts all heading back up. And 2000, the fourth year, it says a bunch of chop, up, down, up, down, new highs, and then rip into year five. So surprise me, take it for what you want. You can, I have these charts down on my pin tweet in that article. You can look <laughs> at every single decade. It's, it's, it's and so you're saying that is an unbroken track record for the past century. That's the one thing that seems to be a guarantee. Now, have, me having pointed this out may make this all invalid. Totally recognize this. <laughs> but I, I find that to be the, the most fascinating thing. So it, there have been a couple of fourth years that were terrible, like 1974, oil crisis. But 1973 was already a bear market, right? Because we're not in a bear market right now. So th th there were a couple of exceptions where you definitely struggled in the fourth year. In fact, even in 2004, you know, you, you, you had the strong start, by the way, that was also a presidential election year, 2004, I believe. 
There was a lot of back and forth chop. There was even a new low in in the summer of that year, but not below the October lows of 2003. And then just ripped higher. And then of course, 2005, the, the rest is history. I, it basically what it says, what we said earlier is that whatever happens in, in, in 2024, that pattern structure, that history, that so far has a 100% track record says, whatever low you get, you buy into 2024. In, the, in your four. All right. And, um, and, and we can debate what that low may be. I, I, I have no idea. Right. I mean, there's there's all kinds of possibilities I'm, I'm looking at, but I think it, it is weird to think that markets have reacted in a very consistent manner over the course of over 100 years in a, in each decade. Well, and that's the world you live in, where you're a guy who looks at patterns. Right. Um, so I, I do want to give note to the the folks I've had on the channel recently who have you know, a, a much sh uh, they have a very short-term focus. So these are these tend to be folks that have a trading model and the headlight of their trading model goes out a, a month or three months or whatever. And they have been saying for the past month or so, all indicators are green, right? And the market has been rewarding that. Um, and it, But then also when we look at people who have a, um, a much longer view, um, so one that would share the arc that you just mentioned there, um, Sven, is Michael Howell, who his work very much focuses on liquidity. He thinks that liquidity is going to keep going, keep rising from here. He says it's going to be a rising tide for the next two years. So he expects both the economy and the markets to do very well between now and two years from now. You know, Again, nothing goes in a straight line, but he's got a lot of confidence. It's going to be a lot higher uh, in two years from now than it is now, which your your projection would say. And, and Michael is, I would put him in the bull camp. What's interesting is I would put some of the bears that I've had on this channel into the same camp. And so we look at a guy like Felix Zuloff, right? Who um, I would say, Sven, I think his macro thoughts are, are quite similar to yours in terms of the concerns and whatnot. Um, he says we're in the era of the roller coasters where we're going to see these, these market breakages and then... Um, moonshots as the the stimulus you know keeps getting bigger and bigger every time and looking at it this year when i interviewed him a month ago he said he, he believed that the the markets in the the markets were going to do really well in q1 uh he believed the economy was going to surprise everybody uh to the upside um but he didn't think that these were really sustainable uh it was sustainable growth that was you know pushing the economy and so he expects the downside of the roller coaster this year with, um, you know, we hit an all-time high, say at some point around the end of Q1, and then it falls, the market falls uh, through the rest of the year, perhaps falling pretty substantially. But then like you, he expects a big central planner rescue and markets to hit all-time new highs by a long shot in 2025. Again, not for good fundamental reasons, just because of, you know, they're being juiced by all of this uh, rescue stimulus. So I, I just want to sort of connect these dots from different people we've had on the channel. Even though you don't love what you're saying, you know, I think your arc is to a certain extent supported by by other people, some of whom are using different methodologies or looking through different lenses, but still coming to the same conclusion. Yeah, I mean, look, the deciding factor last year was simply liquidity, right? Uh, the 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 we had that tightening move. You know, everybody was talking about, oh, M2 growth is negative, and that means the end of the world. Well, if you look at M2 in, in absolute terms, you know, it barely budged off from the post-COVID highs. I mean, it was it, it was a very minute reduction. And if you look at it in terms of year over year, it actually increased since the banking crisis last March, you know, in terms of the, the trajectory. Uh, so all the indicators were back north and we see equity prices basically following suit there um and uh, again if something bad were to happen in 24 and you get some sort of scarecrow moment you you just know the this is the most awesome firepower potential firepower the fed has had in many 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 years 5.33 percent fed funds rate you know, see a crisis, they popped up to zero in a heartbeat, you know, and QE, 
you know, again, COVID, we've seen what this all can do, right? Now, having said all this and, and talking about markets in context of this four-year cycle and choppiness and so forth, uh, I want to dig a little bit into some of the technicals for a moment because th there's one chart I want to show you, which is the strongest sector we all know, technology, NDX. Right? I have a monthly chart of NDX. I find interesting is one of those charts that says, okay, maybe I want to be a little bit cautious right now. A little bit of context. First of all, I have not adjusted these trend lines in at least a couple of years ever. I mean, COVID crash created a new trend line in 2020 uh, for, from my perspective. These, these trend lines have been in place for years. And it was interesting when in, if you look at the NDX there in the middle of 2020, when they saved... When, but right before the COVID crash, NDX hit the, the, that center trend line again perfectly, right? And it rejected from there and it bottomed at this new trend line that was created. And then we got the stimulus and then it ripped above that trend line, that center trend line. And if, if you look closely, you can see then there was a little back test of it in, in kind of the fall of 2020. That was these two little corrections that just back tested it and it just ripped higher into the top of 2022 i want to and the 22 top actually coincided with a long-term trend back to 2006 and the reason i mention this is because these big big picture trend lines for some reason i can't tell you why the market tends to respect them in a big way in fact when we had the big you know tightening move there in 2022 what you can see is and i talked about this last year uh, you know, at the end of 22, beginning of 2023, is how precisely NDX kept tagging that new uptrend line that was created with the COVID crash. I mean, ding, ding, ding. That's mm -hmm. why I said, you know, controlled bear market. We talked about it at the time. It was, it was, it just held every single time. It was amazing. And in the process of all of this, it kind of created this really steep falling wedge. And if you see at the bottom of the chart, that was new highs, new lows. That was like the most red blood sea of red we'd seen since the global financial crisis. So you see the, the most intensive selling since the financial crisis, and you can't break the trend, and you got a bullish falling wedge. What does that tell you? That tells you big rally is coming, right? I mean, that that was the, the case then. And then we had this big rip up. And then in the fall, basically all it did is build a bull flag and then rip right back to this trend line. Guess what? We just hit it this week, January 31st, hit it perfectly and reject it. Wow. I mean, I'm just as a technician, I go, wow, this, this stuff still has relevance, <laughs> you know? Now, does that mean end of the line and everything falls apart? I can't say that. Is it making the case for maybe a corrective case? Yeah. In fact, if you look back at the low end of it, what's kind of disturbing here is despite how powerful this rally has been the new highs and the new lows on ndx have not expanded in fact they've gotten weaker since last year i mean in, in january look i mean this is a monthly chart obviously but look at the close of the month there's just nothing there and it, and it speaks to the awesome thinning of this market that we're all aware of with the mac sevens uh, the market cap expansion that we've seen in some of these stocks uh have absolutely been not only historic in terms of size and velocity, but they're just absolutely stunning and it's concerning. In fact, over the holidays, I ran into a multi decade money manager here in the UK. Very, very calm, very rational, intelligent guy. He's been in the business for a very long, long time. And we were talking markets a little bit, a little bit shop talking. And he expressed to me, you know, as, as an asset manager, fund manager, how on the one hand, he's very concerned about the thinning of the market. But on the other hand, it also has a real life implication for him. And that one is broad and it's, it's very real uh, for the entire industry. He has long-term clients that love him to death. And they say, you know, you're a great guy. You do great work but why am I paying you? 
you 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 do all this work and all this analysis and you lag in the index mm -hmm. because unless if you are remember the old adage you, know, you want to be diversified and risk management and all this if you're truly diversified in this market you're lagging the index because the power of the few is so dominating I mean, like tonight we got three stocks reporting right amazon apple and and meta that's five and a half trillion dollars in two stocks you know 10 stocks 50 percent of the qqq it's it's super thin in terms of the leadership so these guys are in a terrible position because on the one hand they get pressure because how do i catch up and then they have to engage in chasing we saw this again at the end of the um, of 2023 the, yeah. the the reason we get these year-end rallies they have to chase they have to chase they have to chase they have no choice and, and, and it's, it's almost it's it's sorry to interrupt but it's 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 not just a chasing it's it's like having a sword point at your back like they I, I think most of them don't want to do it on a fundamental level they're just like i, I don't no. believe these companies have the upside ahead that their valuation suggest but to your point they've got like a professional spear at their back that says hey if you want to stay in business you got to do this yeah, and so you then create behavioral, I mean, a behavioral scientists can probably look at this, but you're creating behavior that's completely disconnected from anything fundamental because it becomes a mechanical game and, and how to position and how to, you know, be, be forced basically to maintain your job in one way or another. Right, and sorry uh, to your point, but it's like it's like that I had to burn the village to save it. It's like I had to breach my fiduciary duty to my clients to do what they wanted me to do. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because they that, that's exactly what happened into year end. They chased everything up. And then at the beginning of January, they immediately sold out um, because I'm guessing they were probably imbalanced in terms of what their mandate may be. So they sold out. You saw the first week dip in January. And then guess what? Markets went right back up on the heels of the few and they were forced to chase again. But now they, they haven't again allocated the same aggressive level as the end, end of 2023 so that by by math implication means they're lagging again right it's 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 one of those things and th this is actually why i want to show a just mind-blowing chart um you know we everybody talks about equal weight and this that and the other there's a chart i've been tracking for years it's called xvg it's the value line geometric index let me explain what that means. What it does, what this indicator does, basically says we're taking, I think it's based on 1,600 stocks, and we assign the same value to them. They're all worth $100. And then we measure how they move relative to each other as price changes. So it, it kind of gives you, it's, you know, all the indices have basically a market cap weighting tracker to it meaning you know apple has a greater influence than a, a stock that is worth you know 10 billion dollars in market cap vis-a-vis -vis 3 trillion so obviously then you look at the s p or the nasdaq 100 and you see how these indices indices rip to new high it's maybe a different way of looking at equal weight and there's a couple of really interesting things i want to highlight the first part and it's not the blue boxes, I'll get to them. It's the right half of the chart. And which basically says is this broad index in, in 1600 stocks in the market has been in a very contained range since basically Russia invaded Ukraine, right? That's when we fell down and we've been in this chop range for the better part of almost two years. And the bottom pink line, if you look to the left, that was resistance in in the beginning of 2020 after the COVID crash. It was key support in October of 2022. It held. And it was a support again in October of 2023. Because as you recall, you know, a lot of indices were lagging up until that point last year. And hence, by the way, that chart was a screaming buy on the daily version. We had a really nice positive divergence and it again hit that key support. And what we saw, it ripped higher brutally in, into the end of the year. That was the big rally. But first point to note here, just actually fascinating to me, is that that 
rally in XVG again stopped dead in its tracks at the top pink line, the resistance mm -hmm. line. I mean, just perfect. It's like, wow, it mattered again. So as a from a philosophical point of view, I would just say argue with everyone, and not argue, but suppose to everyone that for me to see a really confirmed new bull market, you would want XVG to cross above that line. And and give, by the way, I was on vacation the, the tail end of the year. And when I came back and looked at this chart, I was actually surprised it had not crossed. I would have expected it to cross because all of a sudden everything was rallying, right? The small caps, everybody was talking about the big catch up trade, blah, blah, blah. It hasn't crossed. Uh, so I'm a little bit baffled. And now, now it gets even more interesting. You noticed that the S&P obviously last week this week made new all-time highs, all-time record highs. On the bottom, you see the S&P. While XVG, after that first dip in January, did not make a new high. It made a lower high. That's a negative divergence. That's a red flag. And this is why I bring in the other blue boxes. Because ironically, we saw the same behavior in the lead up to the 2022 top. If you hmm. can see at the top or at the bottom, you see S&P making new highs, but XVG did not. It made a lower high, negative divergence. If you go back to pre-COVID crash, the bottom S&P makes new high into February, right? Everybody ignored COVID and XVG did not. It made a lower high. Now, obviously, I'm not calling for crash here or anything like that, but I'm noting that in the last few years, that behavior has been troublesome. It would at least suggest there's now some sort of risk of a pullback slash correction. If I tie it back to what we just saw with the NDX, the strongest index hitting a key multi-decade trend line, I would say, you know, given everything that has happened and how strong this rally has been, that kind of makes sense to me. But I have to say also, and this is this is the other thing that's absolutely baffling here, the fact that S&P and NASDAQ and Dow made new all-time highs, but XVG continues to be stuck in this box so much lower below previous all-time highs. That is reflective of maybe that really two-sided economy because if you look at utilities, you look at transports, small caps I mentioned and so forth, they're not anywhere near all-time highs, and they're not doing really well. Uh, so you you have, you know, party headlines on the main indices, but what lurks beneath is is pretty dark. Um, so I'm 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 a bit concerned about that. I have to say, and I'm obviously curious how this plays out, and which transitions me now to, you know, we've seen. Things that are normal, like yields turning and that being peak of the tightening cycle, and therefore that's relief. Um, we we see some, you know, unusual behavior, obviously in, in construct of the economy and, and the deficit. Uh, and I look at this chart. I'm 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 overtly transversing into the bizarre. And I'll give you one specific example on BPSPX. It's one of those classic signal charts that we track on a regular basis because it, it it's on the RSI and top kind of gives you sense when things get cooked on the overbought side and when it gets oversold on the bottom side. And sometimes you have these nifty little divergences you can pick out. For example, I, I put in here the one that we had in the fall, in the fall correction here into from September, October. This was a classic buy signal, right? Because the BPSPX in the center of the chart made a new low, but the RSI on top did not. That's a positive divergence. And then we saw this, this massive rip back to overbought. And, and two things happened here. So first of all, the rally was so powerful that the RSI on top got to 90. I, I've seen that a couple of times in, in eight, nine, 10 years, a couple of times. The usual market script for something like this, like 2018 and what have you, is that then there is a pullback. And then if you look for some sort of topping signal, 
you would then wait for a new high on BPSPX, basically the polar opposite of the positive divergence at the low, and look for a negative one where the RSI goes to like 70, 75, makes a lower high vis-a-vis -a, -vis a new high on BPSPX. That, that's kind of my expectation. I When I saw that 90 reading, I said, that's okay, that I can already see where this is going. So I thought, what? What I see here, I've never seen before. I mean, I've seen a lot in markets and sometimes things surprise me, but this one blows my mind because in this last week, S&P, new high every day, new all-time high, new all-time high, new all-time high. And I look at that RSI on top. It's not even ticking up. It's not moving. What is that about? Because usually you see it moving up. You can you look at the history of that chart. You know, when, when you have a rally, especially to new highs, it's kicking up. It's not kicking up. And that just tells me that there is a lot of selling underneath this market that is masked by the indices, the main indices that make new all-time highs driven by a few stocks. Which now brings us to a really bizarre conclusion. <clears throat> Because, you know, with XVG, I can say make the case, oh, you know, everything is just about to be horrible. But now I'm looking at a chart that says, you know, this is almost oversold. Even though we just had one down day of all-time highs on the Dow, right? And and I'm going to extend this chart to the next chart, which is the NICE. That's one of those big weekly oscillated charts I like looking at because it kind of gives me a really good sense when markets are really fried on the downside when they're setting up for a rally or when they're they're getting cooked to the upside and maybe it's time to you know reduce exposure and all that stuff uh, that black line that kind of oscillates up and down hence it's called an oscillator it kind of gives you a sense for what is regular market rhythm okay and First thing you got to note is here, so we just made new all-time highs multiple times in the last two weeks. And this thing is almost max oversold. That's stochastic. It's almost as oversold as it was at the October lows. And we're looking at this as like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's not normal. And, and you know, usually when you look at these bottom signals, you know, on the oscillator, you, you can see it yourself on the chart. That's usually the result of markets having pulled back probably at least a couple of weeks, maybe three, and you, you can be in the midst of a big correction. Um, see that time and time and time again, happens several times a year, right? Sometimes it gets to max oversold, sometimes it doesn't. There's only one time where I can say markets made new all-time highs and this thing has been kicking to oversold. And that was right before the COVID crash again. Hmm. Don't ask me why. I mean, you can you can see that that's that vertical blue line I, I tagged in. You know, we had this initial high or this all-time high into the end of the year. And we had a dip. Uh, I think it was a January uh, correction. The NICE indicator itself, that's the blue and red candlestick movement, corrected a little bit. And then S&P made a new all-time high on the lower read basically the same level as it's doing now. And the stochastic was nearly max oversold. That was before the crash. It wasn't oversold after the, I mean, it was obviously over, more oversold after the crash. I'm just saying we're, we're watching a chart that has a many, many year track record of acting in a certain rhythm. And now it's behaving very unusually. And the only precedent I have for that acting this weirdly was before the COVID crash. Again, I'm not calling for a crash. I'm just saying there's some really odd things going on in the charts that have me baffled. You know, be, I mean, and you can take these two things, in, these in two different ways. You're saying, well, you know, it, it because COVID was an event and something happened, it turned out to be a massive bull trap and we got the crash. Fine, you can take that interpretation. Um, but the, the flip side to this, this is, I'm just telling you straight, you know, where I feel analytically challenged, the flip side to this is to say, well, maybe 
while mark while the indices are making new all-time highs day after day after day the broader market is correcting significantly underneath and it becomes ever more oversold and that means any dip you get may be extremely shallow and then this thing can really fly to the upside right um so that's the i guess the mystery of discovery that we have a, ahead of us and if liquidity has anything to do with it then of course i would be curious to see what happens now that they're going to reduce remove btfp in march uh and what happens with the reverse repo facility because all of these have been great incremental contributors to liquidity uh as i said earlier you know the fourth year tends to be choppy presidential election years tend to have weakness in the first quarter so maybe this all coincides in some sort of weakness into march uh but then you know if i, if I look at charts like this and let's say we get weakness into february march then these kind of charts already tell me we're going to be oversold very quickly. The question then becomes how much downside you're going to get. Basically, it's already setting up for a buy. You know, that's that's kind of the message here. Unless something breaks, and of course, then we have something else to deal with. Right. But what I'm what I'm trying to tell to tell you is that while part of the rally has been completely rational and it's been driven by factors that support that rally. It's now morphed into some really odd behavior on the signal front that's a bit head scratching and in the past has produced sizable corrective activity, basically. Okay. So um, I've written a lot of notes while you were talking there. Um, I'll get to my last one here, which is I, I take from the preponderance of this, Sven, that you're, you're kind of nervous about the market right now, um, that you see a lot, potentially a good deal of reasons for, for why some sort of correction, who knows how prolonged or deep it would be, but that could happen this year. And you've already said earlier, you sort of expect turbulence, volatility uh, this year. Something eventually that probably will spark uh, intervention at some point later this year, which would make 2025 maybe be a really bonanza year for the markets. Am I accurate in saying that you're kind of nervous right now? No, I'm, I'm relaxed. I, I <laughs> look, <laughs> I'm I'm trying to, and I, I told this to to our clients as well. I'm trying to be as practical as possible and trying to be very tactical and opportunistic like you know we had closed most of our longs before we um went on vacation right before christmas we came back had a little bit left and then we're looking at okay well how's this market going to play and we walked straight into the first dip in in weeks right and just looking at the technicals it was saying buy and then we had the next dip buy there were two dips that was basically it and and that worked out great in 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 January, but now as these signals have evolved into the bizarre fashion that they have, you know we're we're back to square one. I mean I, I have zero complaints about January. It was all great, but now I am cautious. Okay, I'm cautious based on all these signals on on where we are in the charts and. I don't have a swing buy setup at this moment. I said, we'll, we'll stay tactical until we have a swing buy setup. And to get a swing buy setup, I can think of a couple of scenarios. Now I'll share one with you. And it's, it's totally theoretical at this point, but if you pull up the S&P chart I sent you, um, my, my view on these things generally is, okay, I, I look at technicals and if, if a pattern works, it works uh, until it no longer is relevant. And on the S&P chart, this was a chart I put out on Twitter. Not this one. It's, oh, not this the, one. Okay, sorry. That's that's the yearly. <laughs> that, that's, that's not a buy setup at this point, but <laughs> it may well turn into one. Now, the, the, in, in early October, I, I put out this concept of the cup and handle. We've got since copied obviously all around but the point was you know looking at through you know this whole decline in 22 and then the uptrend line uh you know the the covid lows and then the low of 
the October 22 bottom, um, that weakness into the fall, if there is to be weakness, it would set up for a potential powerful cup and handle pattern. And when Israel invaded, or rather Hamas invaded Israel, we, we got a moment of sweat there. Because, you know, as you recall, that, that was a budget concern that this could go regional again and, and create a wider conflict. But that was also the time when Janet Yellen talked about higher for longer than necessarily a given. Um, Janet beats war. And so this, this temporary trend break just didn't even last. It was saved. It was saved the next week. Uh, so that was that was my moment of conviction challenging, frankly. But you know, again, I would refer you back to that XVG chart. It was cooked. It was very much oversold. Uh, and so this trend held. And then, you know, up until this week, we had, what, 13 weeks straight up or 12, right. 12 weeks straight up out of 13 or something like that. I mean, it's just th this is this is the kind of stuff bears never get ever. Only bulls get that straight up you don't get straight down i mean COVID crash three four weeks that's it right even though in the peak of the tightening cycle i think six seven weeks that was that was the unusual down move back then you, this this one way fashion you just never get um but what we got technically objectively observe here is this pattern is played it was a powerful breakout and it's just ripped higher and structurally this chart has moved a room into 5,400, okay? Now, with all the things I talked about, um, what would make sense to me in context of history, seasonalities, key, key levels being hit and weakness underneath, what would theoretically make sense to me is that we would see some sort of backtest, you know? And... And I outline here a red line, which is completely theoretical, but it happens to be that the uptrend line from the COVID crash lows in 20 and that downtrend line that was successfully broken out of, they interject. Guess when? March. <laughs> right during this Q1 seasonal weakness and so forth, uh, BTFP. And, and the, expiry of, uh, yeah, the expiry of the B, B, BTFP and all yep. that stuff. And, yeah. And the next Fed meeting, you know, how do you convince Powell to cut rates? Something scary happening in markets. You, you know, look, I, I can't predict this. But what would, in my mind, for example, be a just powerful swing buy setup with the view that this pattern structure could go to 5,400 is the S&P, for example, pulling back to those two lines. And there's, by the way, some other confluence areas there of moving averages on longer term charts and shorter term charts that would all kind of meet in that general vicinity. So yeah. I would, I would, and then, you know, context of these oversold charts, we would be cooking oversold, right? right. And, we would and have, sorry to interject, I just got to laugh that like, that would, that's at 4,500 for folks that, that are listening on a podcast and can't see this chart. You know, we were just at 4,500 back in what, November? Right, like it, it'd be fun. It's funny that that would be panic, right? That would be a reason for the Fed to maybe justify cutting, which is a return to only forty five hundred. Well, I mean, look, that, that's how these corrections go. I mean, in in essence, from current highs, if they stick, I don't know, but if if the current highs were to stick, we're talking about a literally garden variety seven, excuse me, eight eight percent correction. That's what that would be. And, and the level actually, I think, is 45, 25. But, you know, who knows where, if, if that were to happen, right. it could, we could have another one of those fake scary dips. You know, right. there, there's but, always but perfectly that. normal, right? 8% correction after perfect. a runoff well, like this, perfectly normal. But if, if I look at now how the market's been evolving, and all of a sudden you see, you know, big cap tech stocks just absolutely getting creamed. You just know how sent, how quickly sentiment is going to shift. It's the end of the world again, especially if you get a pierce down, if you get a yeah. pierce down below the trend line. I mean, then, then we'd be looking at a massively oversold chart. Small caps would be puking again. Banks, God knows what's going on with them. I mean, we already see rumblings right now. Uh, that's that's where the psychology then comes in, you know. 
and and then you know then you could even make the argument oh my god we've obviously dropped far below the 22 highs again and this all looks like a massive double top you, you can just see the narratives already right and saying oh my god that was a big big double top it's all over goodbye sure sure Plus, I, just, I, I, I just feel not, like i'm not saying i'm not saying that can't happen right uh, i'm just saying if if we were to get such a pullback which seems completely out of reach at the moment because we we can't even have our more than one down day on the occasion right because that's that's just the way this market has been run but i'm so i'm just proposing this as a theoretical and say you know let's say we were at that level in march right around the fed meeting everybody's scared there's a lot of confluence support there and forget all the macro and everything else uh technically that looks extremely clean now mm -hmm. as as mike tyson once said you know everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face you know it's, it's always nice to look at these things in theory but when you know when the when you get carpet bombed by selling stocks the, the psychology is always a very different one but i'm just saying in context you know of these fourth year seasonality and shop it's a cool potential setup. That's kind of basically what I'm saying at this point. I don't, we may not even get that low or, or it may break. I mean, these are the things that's what makes trading fun, right? It's, it's, it's always uncertainty, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to be extremely flexible and practical here, but also keep an eye on, on what has mattered so far. And so far this construct has mattered in a big way. It's been very important and and yet again you know at the moment when it could have broken it was saved again which yeah. has been the hallmark of the last four years well and I, I guess that's where i'm going which is I, I, you know were this to play out and hit that red zone that you've identified there shouldn't be a shock to anybody with a brain or market experience for all the reasons we just talked about it would be a perfectly normal thing to expect i just feel that the you, you're very correct points about the sentiment that we'd have then it really belies this story of like strength and resilience that we're being told where just a small garden variety pullback is is interpreted by the market as the onset of armageddon right and it, 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 it kind of like a shark has to keep swimming or else it drowns right we have this market that like unless it's christmas morning every day you know it's 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 the end of the world um, and I just wonder if that does belie the fact that, you know, everything we're sort of being told, all the reasons not to worry, you know, it's like, why? If this thing just seems like it's going into cardiac arrest every time it's not having a perfect day. I mean, the, the hardest part of trading is psychology. Yeah, I, I think most traders would acknowledge that, uh, you know, everybody wants a dip until they actually have one and then they're scared to buy right because yeah. and, and and look it happens to the best of them the most professional ones i mean remember october 22 when the s p was cracking through 3600 you got firms left right and center calling for 3200 and and this is this is and there's two coins to this because you know if you're in a, in the midst of a heavy correction you as a trader always have to look at what the potential downside risk levels are right you you always want to be aware of of pivots and yeah you got to be aware of that well what then happens is when you're on twitter or what else and everybody is screaming for these lower targets it starts impacting people's psychology mm -hmm. they get scared they get scared and then they're afraid to pull the trigger because they're afraid it may go down to that level you know I, I guess no one heard of stop management <laughs> you know you, you can manage that risk with stops by the way but it's it's common human psychology and you have to pull the opposite when you have these big monster rallies that we've seen time and time and time again that go on forever and ever and ever and and they just keep squeezing and and, that, and they defy credulity you know because they get dumber every time it's like seriously now you're upgrading 
like BlackRock this week. Okay, so we did what thirteen up weeks and fourteen, and here comes BlackRock and upgrades to your stocks. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks you so know, much. where were you in October? Okay, when right. it actually mattered, right? Uh, and 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 so then you have the polar opposite psychology as markets seem bulletproof. We go up every day. Every dip is bought. You know, the VIX is crushed. Nothing bad can happen. And the market ignores everything. You know, like in the last months now, even this week, you know, we get news of everybody bombing everyone. It looks like it again. No one cares. No one know. cares. Well, your point about the Mag 7, you know, we have a bunch of companies getting pulled in front of Congress right now who's basically debating whether or not these companies should start to be allowed to get sued or whatnot. Um, nobody really seems to care. No, no. I mean, you know, one thing we can never trade on is geopolitical risk. Uh, we can be aware it's out there, uh, but generally the market ignores it, right? Ukraine, Russia, that mattered for a little bit, but we're at new all-time highs. The war is still going on. Israel, Hamas, that mattered for two weeks. Right, right. the closing of the Red Sea. Yawn. <laughs> yawn. You know, uh, all that matters, and that's and unfortunately, I hate to be so bland about this, like we talked last year. All that matters is the directional flow of liquidity and whether financial conditions get tighter or looser. All right. And who's the boss on that, Janet? <clears throat> you know, and, and, and I, I, I'm not a political guy, but I'm, I'm also wise to the world, I would think. And I hate to say it, but it's an election year and there are political motivations. You know, and, and I don't like it, but I can see it in the works. Right, you tell right. me it's a pure coincidence that we're making new all-time highs right at the beginning of a new election year. Right. You, you might Please. not like that there's a steamroller going down the street in a direction you don't want it to go in, but it doesn't mean it's wise to stand in front of it. That's that's exactly right. You know, I don't like that truck. Let me stand in front of it. Yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> that's, that's the raging against the machine. You know, we all got to be... You know, we may not like it, but we got to be practical. We got to understand who controls what. Now, if if things change and we see breakdown of true support, like, for example, that 4,500 area level, if that pattern were to bust down and break down and, you know, and it may get temporarily, I don't know. But if that's, you know, already the next level to look at, look at, which is that yearly chart I showed earlier, which is the yearly 5 EMA. Yeah, that was support every single year. It's at 4,300, you know? Okay, show me an end of the year close below that. And by the way, if we drop, that EMA drops further, okay? It's going to mm -hmm. start sinking a little bit. Yep. So you may get to 4,300 and the, the EMA is maybe at 4,200, you know, because by definition, they're moving averages. They move along with what price is doing. So you got to keep an eye on them, you know? Uh, if, if we were to drop to let's say 43, 4,200 from here, which is, by the way, what is that? November levels? <laughs> yeah, like I was saying, yeah. Maybe, it would maybe seem late October. like the end of the world again. But all we're doing is, again, touching key historic support. So un unless you break this by the end of the year, sorry, Bears, you've got nothing from a large structural perspective. But, but I tell you one thing you do have, if I, I bet you right now, if we were to drop this year below that yearly five EMA by the end of the year, 2025 is going to be rate cut QE party time. And presumably that is go long big time. Well, when the COVID crash happened, where was the Fed funds rate at the time? It was much lower than it was now. And you know how much how are they unleashed? And this was, by the way, part of my consideration in the Cynics Guide to Market. You know, for years I've been rambling on about market cap to GDP, right? Because, you know, we had the big tech bubble in 2000, where that got to 150% market valuations vis-a-vis -vis the underlying GDP of the economy. Whereas, you know, in, in the 
70s 80s were it was around 60 to 80 percent so that what happened in 2000 was just unprecedented at the time and then we had the big recession and got back to 75 percent then they intervened you know and cut rates to zero and we got the housing bubble got to about 137 140 percent and then we had the global financial crisis and it dropped to 50 percent and then of course that was the beginning of permanent intervention and it got so bad following the COVID crash that we ended up at an all-time peak of 200% market cap to GDP. Absolutely insane. And, and guess what? It happened in 22 when we had that year of down. It just got back to the very top of the tech bubble, yeah. which was 150%. That was the bottom. 150% is now the new floor. And now we're we're heading back up to 180%. And I, you know, I used to rail at all this. And then I, I'm starting to suspect something much darker going on here because we it used to be that markets reacted to the economy right but then it started disconnecting you know you know you know the phrase that's out there you know markets are not the economy and vice versa well i have news for you when when you have financial markets that are so much larger than the economy itself you it's almost like a clear and present danger you cannot let this thing drop in a major way because everything and every everything is invested and centered and financed by financial markets all of a sudden maybe everything we talked about in terms of the magic savings makes sense if you're a policy maker maybe you have two issues. One is what influences which more? Does does the economy influence markets more that are much larger? Or is it that markets influence the economy more now that they've gotten so much bigger? So if you really want to manage the economy, maybe what you have to do is manage markets. I know it's dark. Because basically what it says is we are now in the business of driving sentiment and consumer spending vis-a-vis -vis the, the direction of markets. We wanted to slow down markets with tightening. We brought markets down. But not to a point where it could be a systemic issue. Just enough. Right? Consumer sentiment on the floor. And guess what? Consumer sentiment is going back up now. Why? Because markets have been magically rising, right? And and, yeah. and 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 this is where the second part comes in, which is the even darker part. Right, it gets you even know, darker. Talk, yeah, because we talked about all these net constructs and knowing how trapped they are and these refinancing requirements. Any party doesn't matter which one cannot afford a just massive reset i mean it, it you, you wouldn't have a recession you would have an outright catastrophe and depression which would be prohibitive to being able to even finance what you have to finance that the whole system wouldn't work so i i'm almost i'm almost afraid we've gotten to the point now where financial markets have to be managed to prevent the unthinkable. And because they've gotten so large vis-a-vis -vis the economy, it's actually convenient because you can manage the economy with that. It's, it's kind of self-serving in a way. Now, you, you would probably ask me, well, how is this all sustainable? Beats the hell out of me. But if, if you're trapped in that way, you have no choice but to continue. And, you know, if, if they, what the last four years have shown is how incredibly powerful and effective they are in managing that equation. Certainly has gone way beyond my expectations. I'm impressed, I have to say. I don't agree with it because guess what? 
here we are at new all-time highs, and you know what that means. The net worth of the top 0.1% is at all-time highs, over $20 trillion. And by the way, folks, the top 0.1%, what is that? That's 132,000 households. 132,000 households. And you got to be worth at least 46 million to be in that 0.1%. Okay? $20 trillion. Don't even look where the bottom 50% are in aggregate. It, it's it's a pittance. And obviously the bottom 50%, it's, you know, over 100 million people. It's a huge yeah, number. Rounding error assets-wise, sadly. And while everybody's victory lapping about the soft landing, just look at all transaction prices of housing. Record high. You know, recessions used to serve a purpose, which was cleansing of excess. But now we are in the point where housing is completely unaffordable for millions and millions and millions of people. To the majority. Vast majority. And it's especially the young who can't move out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see it here in London too. I mean, it's, oh my God, yeah. how, how are young kids supposed to afford this? You and I have kids. I think we're wondering uh, how the hell are they going to afford all this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about buying them a boat, teaching them to sail, go somewhere. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's it's a real issue. And now we're in this position where, where everybody's claiming victory on inflation. And how insulting is that? Because... Prices are sky high still. They're not going to come down. We're just a new normal, much higher up. Housing hasn't corrected at all. You know, you can argue commercial real estate, but that doesn't apply to the regular family. So the 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 middle class again got screwed here. While the very top of the art uh, Echelon got to keep all of their post-COVID excess gains. That that top 0.1%, they added $5 trillion to their wealth following COVID. And they're right back at it. Right. And folks, have, homes. folks have heard me mention a lot on this channel recently that the new survey results are out that uh, in the US, 93% of financial assets are owned by the top 10% of households. So yeah, spend your point, if, if the policy is that markets must go up, then the policy is is the top elite are going to get even more advantaged relative to everybody else, or or controversially, it, 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 everybody else is going to be much more disadvantaged. It it's not even advantage is not even the term. I guess it's just total dynasty wealth creation in the hands of the few at the expense of the many because they're right. stuck with us. Na national because... slash global aristocracy. Yeah, and and you know, look, I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. I've I've greatly benefited from the capitalist system that we have. But that's a social trend that scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And you and I have talked a lot about this in the past. And I, I yeah. actually had a question here about it because we should probably do a discussion that's just focused on that, Sven, because I think we have a lot of material to say. Let, let me ask you this, and you might not have an answer to this. It's okay if you don't. But let's say I make you Emperor Sven, okay? So for, for a limited period of time, you can tell everybody what to do. What, what reforms would you think of to, to try to address this accelerating wealth inequality gap? This, this is where, first of all, I don't want to be emperor. I just, no, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Is it not? Right. Yeah. yeah. But like I said, it's a limited period of time. If, if, if you don't give up the reins, we cut your head off, but you get a limited period of time to, to do some good. I, I hate to say it. I, I don't, I wouldn't like the solutions that maybe were, would be obvious. I mean, you know, I hear top people talking about taxing the hell out of the rich or, or what have you. Um, I mean, I, I a lot of people are really wealthy because they actually done really well for themselves. They've, they've worked hard. Uh, they've been smart and they've been building successful businesses. I'm, I'm not making this a envy of the rich. I think most rich people, unless they just fell into it by inheritance, 
I think most people that are rich and have worked themselves into position to be rich, they deserve to be rich, you know. And then you know, I can I can look here at the UK where I'm paying just ridiculous amounts of taxes, and I say, come on, guys, really, you know, this this is this is insane. And what are you doing with it? What am I getting for in, in return? You know, um, it's. But at the same time, when when you are wealthy. And the wealthy have power to lobby and, you know, help set the rules, if you will. Right. Uh, they, they've gained a lot of additional advantages um, in, in actual terms of tax structures and clever ways of shell companies and this, that and the other. It's 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 there's there's a lot of people that are gaming the system to to their advantage because greed, I guess. Right. You know. If you want a bill, if you have a billion, you want three. If you have three, you want ten. You know, when is enough in, in, enough? Um, it's. I'm afraid it's not one of those things that can be solved organically, but it's also one of those things I would not want to see solved top down. Uh, meaning by. By by force, by, force, by re redistributive. Yeah. Hey, we're just taking all your money. Yeah. The ideal, and this is where maybe again you scratch the cynic and find a disappointed idealist. The ideal way would be actually would happen organically, that there is an appeal to our better angels as a society to recognize. The, the path we've been on and are going on in this direction is not for the betterment of our global village, society, whatever you want to call it. And it's going to lead to a really dark path. And, you know, when I see billionaires that have all the wealth they could ever want in the world arguing like children on Twitter. I'm very disappointed, guys. I mean, you, you're the guys that have built great companies. You're the guys that have the smarts. What is that behavior? I mean, could, could we elevate everything a little bit? The, the problem is we have no elevation. I look at the political spectrum these days, and I'm just absolutely disappointed in humanity. Sorry, folks. I mean... Plato would not be impressed. Okay, I don't see, I don't, I don't see anything on the political horizon that says that things are going to get better. That, that, that there's adults in the room. It's all gamified. It's ugly. And you know, I hate to say it. You know, sometimes this better angel, you know, organic view may only come if something really terrible happens. Yeah. You know, it's after it's during a crisis and after a crisis that people get together and, and figure things out and help each other. Right. And, and say, hey, maybe there's a better way to do this because what we were doing before led to this terrible crisis. I mean, I'm on record many times on this channel saying, sadly, I my money is on that, uh, that, that we are not going to proactively change our ways for the better. We're going to keep doing what we're doing until we're forced to change. Um, I got to start wrapping it up here, Sven. Yeah. I could keep going forever. Um Thank you again for just putting it all out there the way you always do. Um, on this topic, though, just to wrap it up, <laughs> there are two things that I I, I sussed out of what I, I, you were saying that I think you would be on board with. And um, I'm just going to pose them back to you just to see. And, and, and one of the reasons why I want to have this conversation is that I, I keep bringing up this, this topic about the wealth disparity and the trajectory it's on because I have the exact same concerns that you do. And it is, it's a pretty emotionally charged uh, topic. I mean, most people, I think, are on board with, you know, wealth disparity or growing wealth disparity bad. But when you start to get to specific potential solutions, that's where people really start getting triggered, right? You know, oh, that's socialist or, oh, you know, I'm a libertarian and that goes against what I'm, you know, my ideals or whatever. But the system is has metastasized so far, we, we may be... The, the time for elegant solutions may have passed. And I don't know. I just want to have the debate, right? And so I'm hoping this channel can continue to have the debate on this discussion. Because just like you're talking with the markets, we might not like where they're going or how they're run, but 
just to stand in front of the truck out of protest isn't in our best interest. It's not going to help us. We're just going to get mowed over by it, right? So anyways, two things that I, I thought I heard you say that you maybe you'd be on board with this. One is, if you're emperor, get money out of politics. I know it sounds simple and is incredibly hard, and most people say that'll never happen, but that, that, that would be a big one. And then the second one would be um, stop intervening with natural market forces. Like, I think that would be a way where we could, we could, um, we could we could bring that gap down pretty substantially just by letting markets do what they want to do without all the intervention that's going on, right? And and that wouldn't be I'm not this would be painful, right? <laughs> it wouldn't be fun, but, but it would but, be a but, natural fair way. But this is where where it's hostage taking because let's let's suppose you and I had the chance to talk to the powers that be and and plead with them stop intervening with markets. If I were them, I would tell the, to to the both of us, Adam and Sven. That, okay, we can stop intervening in markets. And by the way, your other issue, wealth inequality. Which twenty million people you want to be un want to see unemployed? Yeah, but to my because point, I, I think we're well beyond the point. one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, he'll lose a few billions of his portfolio. He's still a billionaire at the end of this. Mm -hmm. Which millions of families are you going to screw with a systemic crash of a system? Yeah, sorry, we bloated it up to this degree. But if you want us to stop intervening in markets, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, but I think you'll, you'll be stuck take, in that hostage take situation. To get back out. Yeah, if you capitulate there, you're stuck in that hostage situation forever. Right. So, you know, can we have the system right. correct to a point where it will be more sustainable going forward, hopefully be more fair and 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 maybe more widely distributive of prosperity going forward? But you got to take the pain. Right. That's the that's one of the problems here, which is there is no painless door. Right. And, and well, yeah, it'll hurt to fall from this rung on the on the ladder. But if we wait another 10 or 20 years, we're just going to be that much further high up the ladder. So whether we choose austerity, which we never will. Or if it gets imposed on us, that fall is going to hurt even more. So, I get your point, though. It's it's not a ple not a crowd pleaser. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, COVID was kind of an interesting example, right? Because we had the crash, and to be fair, they they went in and they saved everybody and everything, right? We stimulus checks to help for families and, and this, that, the other. Yeah, what were the size of the checks? Six hundred bucks, sixteen hundred. I forget what it, what it was. No, there were a couple of different sizes, but yeah, there were a couple of different sizes, you know. But the top 0.1% got five trillion in wealth, you know, that amongst the 132,000 right. households. Yeah, again, completely disproportionate. But that's how else do you do that when you're so dependent on markets? I, I don't have the answer. I'm 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 just I'm just seeing an ever more divergent political climate across the globe, and I see ever more political instability as a result of this. No one can see eye to eye. And if you can't see eye to eye, you can't even talk about solutions. Right. Well, and in, in, in addition to the political instability, you're going to get social instability at some point if this keeps going, right? And we're, we've already Absolutely. seen it begin to break out in other places, right? And nobody yeah. wants to see that. But sadly, I think no. that's where we're headed to. All right. So I got to land the plane here. Um, I've got one more question I'm going to ask you, Sven, in just a minute. I got some housekeeping to do first. That question is going to be, What's one non-money related investment you'd encourage folks to develop in their lives? Because we've been talking so much about money so far this conversation. Um, very quickly, folks, um, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Sven, would like him to come back on the program again in the future, particularly if he sees something in his charts that make him think that something important is imminent, please let him know to do that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. I want to remind folks that the... Uh, uh, Wealthy on Spring Conference uh, is coming up fast. It's going to be at March uh, 16th. Uh, yeah, it's going to be Saturday, March 16th. Uh, tickets are already selling very strongly for that, which is great to see. A lot of folks are taking advantage of my urging to register now so you can lock in our lowest early bird price discount. Um, it's nice to see so many folks doing that. And then if you're a subscriber to my premium Substack, you get an additional $50 off of that. Uh, to go learn more about the event and uh, and lock in that low price, go to thoughtfulmoney.com slash conference. Um, and uh, just a reminder for folks, um, you know, Sven talked, has talked a lot about uh, 
the the uncertainty of how, what, what 2024 may bring and you know several times mentioned uh hey you know some some prudent management like maybe some stop management or having some hedges given how overextended the market is um you know it, it all comes down like i say pretty much week after week that the the most people watching this uh should be working with a good professional financial advisor who can put together a plan for them with those type of uh, loss protection mechanisms in place. Um, most people just don't have the experience, uh, the bandwidth with their lives or, or the interest to, to do all this, quite frankly. Um, so highly recommend that you find a good professional advisor to do that. If you've got a good one who's doing it for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the ones that we endorse here at Thoughtful Money. These are the guys to see on the channel every week, like the guys from New Harbor, Lance from RIA, and Jonathan Wellam up in Canada. Uh, to set up one of those free consultations, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, fill out the short form there. Doesn't cost you anything, no commitment to work with those guys, just a free public service they offer. Okay, Sven, we're here at the end here, my friend. Um, that non-money related investment, what do you got for us? Well, at the risk that Tim Cook is going to be upset with me, I would suggest don't get any Apple goggles and actually do the <laughs> pull up. I mean, I'm, I've, I've gone through phases uh, in, my, in my life uh, where I've gotten frustrated and I've gotten out of shape and I've gotten stressed and I've gotten angry, da 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 And I realized that this, this is just not a good state to be. What's, what's the old adage? Health is wealth contentment mm -hmm. is is wealth and there are there, from my perspective mm -hmm. there's nothing more important to do than find a really nice health balance i know we all have to sit in front of screens and looking markets or work or whatever you do and we carry these phones with us around spend as much outside as you can fitness manage your calorie intake i mean i last couple of years after covid i ballooned up i lost a bunch of weight i feel so much better and if you if you balance with yourself and your body you you just have a whole better attitude to life and don't argue with people and strangers on 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 social media why <laughs> <laughs> i mean that, that, that's all part of the equation you yeah. know i mean there's just i know there's all these professional agitators out there and so you know don't don't take everything seriously i mean seriously i mean just just try to find inner balance and and you know spend as much time outside and don't my god don't buy these goggles i i think i put a put a tweet out the other day we're going to go extinct i mean uh, just imagine all us with these goggles and droning around we're, we're getting ever more disconnected from from the real world and i just not for me i'm trying to keep it real all right. Well, very well said. Keep it real, my friend. Um, you know, health, both physical and mental, probably is nothing more important than that. Um, I'd share your concerns, especially if you've ever seen the movie um, Ready Player One. You look at the Apple goggles now and you're like, oh, my God, we're stepping into that dystopian future right now. Um, I, I will say one thing about um, fitness, and you and I talk about it a lot off air, um, Sven. We both have a huge respect for it. Um, one thing that I've I've done recently, just because I had so many things knocking me off my game last year, and everybody knows this, family passing away, the, the COVID and the exam I was taking and all that stuff. Um, one of sort of my gifts to myself health-wise from the start of this year has been to do meal prep. And, you know, nutrition is such an important part of, of, of physical fitness. And um, I think it also helps the mental fitness too. It's really an unfair part. Like if you want to change how your body looks, nutrition is much more important than actually exercise. Um, sad, sad it is to say, we all think, oh, I can just go run a few extra miles. Uh, much less impact than actually getting your eating dialed in. But when you do meal prep, uh, God, it just makes your life so much easier. It, 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 it takes a lot of the worry. It takes a lot of the frustration. And if you can just stick to the meals that you've prepared for yourself on the plan that you've prepared for yourself, you don't have any of that um, you know, shame or, or, you know, self-loathing when you're finding yourself just snacking too much during the day. And it makes just a huge difference in everything. So one little small change folks, um, but, it, and, and it's a change that can help your pocketbook too. You can buy in bulk and prepare in bulk. Um, uh, there's only goodness that comes out of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that commercial, but I'm a huge fan of nutrition and, uh, and meal prep. Um, all right, 
Sven, uh, as always, my friend, it's always so great to catch up with you. Like I said, you've got an open invitation to come back on this channel anytime you like. Thanks so much for giving us so much of your time today. And everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Adam. Take care.